It's Thursday night. You know what that means. It's time for Magic and Martinis. Please welcome your host, Scott Wells. Here, add myself to the stream. Here we go. We got it. We got all going on. John Kiever is here then, too. Thank you, John, very much for joining us from Tampa Bay and Jerry Costello. I'll be seeing you in a couple weeks. Uh, and uh, he says, especially hi to, to Gary. Uh, and he really is a nice guy. All these guys are nice guys. All these people I've had for the past 50, this is the 57th week, have all been really wonderful people. Mike Miller, love you, man. So glad that you're here. Uh, you have in been instrumental in magic in so many ways, uh, promoting magic and booking magic acts for not only China, but then for the various magic conventions uh, around the country and around the world. You just are a, a stellar, outstanding gentleman. And I respect you as I do everyone who's coming in and uh, joining us from week to week. And this is a little bit uh, melancholy from the standpoint, this is our next to last episode. We have been having this again. This is the 57th week and it's just been a whole heck of a lot of fun and I've been enjoying it. But the problem is we're starting to, I say problem, we're real, <laughs> we're glad we're finally gonna be getting back where we're gonna be able to see and uh, touch and shake hands and give everybody a hug and actually have a real drink around the bar, about around a real bar. And still, instead of being in a, uh, a virtual bar like we've been over here. So this has been something that has kind of helped me, and I hope it's helped you throughout this uh, past year then as well, where we've kind of been having this virtual happy hour and opportunity to chat with each other. This has just been, uh, again, just a heck of a lot of fun, and I've enjoyed So cheers to each and every one of you today. Mm -hmm. That is so good. I look forward to Thursdays for more reasons than one. Actually, right now, there are about uh, 78 reasons for all of you guys who are watching then right and gals who are watching right now. This is uh, great. Appreciate it a lot. Now, we're going to be having, uh, again, some great conversation with some uh, great magicians. And uh, yeah, uh, George, we'll talk about Abbott's a little bit uh, then as well, because that's going to be coming up uh, as well. And uh, let's see. Uh, you have to... <laughs> Yes, you will. In two weeks, you have to up that martini gate. And when I'm going to see you, we'll, I'll be over at your place. Listen, I want to get these guys on as quick as I can, because I know that's why you came is really to uh, watch and to listen and to engage in conversation in the chat line over here. Uh, let me also just uh, suggest, by the way, before we get into that, I do want to remind you two things. One is, if you would, please share that. So as you're watching this video, just kind of uh, right over here, here and here. Yeah, just kind of uh, share the video if you I can't do that. Anyhow, just uh, share this on your on your social media, on your feed, so this way others will know what you're doing. You can share this on your to other groups as well as on your social uh, media page on Facebook. That'll be fantastic. I also want to remind everybody this is kind of interesting that this week we had uh, Michael Chout uh, as the guest uh, on the. Magic Word Podcast. So if you hadn't had a chance to download that one yet, if you'll go over to the magicwordpodcast.com, there you will see uh, this week's uh, guest, who is Michael Chout, and he's been a longtime friend. We talk about uh, how the magic, uh, well, not just about Monday Night Magic, but also talk about magic uh, uh, during the 20th century in New York City, like the Magic Townhouse and Imam's uh, uh, place and other places, uh, mostly magic, etc. So anyhow, uh, also, if you have not yet gotten your badge, let me see, where have I got my badge? Someplace here handy, I'm sure. Uh, well, can't put my finger on it right now, but yours should be handy. Hopefully you can go and get that because we're going to be running, having this convention that's been running for so many weeks. Again, for one more week, give you an opportunity to go and, and download that because we've had a lot of great people who have been coming in and enjoying the fun by being on this and wearing your, your name badges. I want to thank all of you guys very much and gals for coming in and, and enjoying uh, joining this convention. It's been just a whole heck of a lot of fun. All right, look, I think it's time to start bringing in some of the guests and let's get started. See, I think I had a couple more quick comments that uh, came in that um, uh, look like uh, uh, Joe. Good, thank you very much, Joe. Like and share, that's the man. See, now that's the kind of attitude and uh, the, that is responsible attitude <laughs> that you're doing. Hey, Clark, you made it in time. So glad that you were here. Uh, I know that you were uh, a little bit worried about trying to get here on time. Haven't missed a thing. We're just getting started. Tim Ellis, good morning from Australia. We'll be seeing you next week, mate. And also we can chat with you. I know it's early morning uh, for you over there. It's great. Uh, and uh, Ali Royal, hello. I'm glad that you're here. All right, let's get a couple of people to uh, get this uh, started, party started. Let me get my first guest in here. And this is a video we just put together, especially for you.
And there he is now. Let's welcome, please, my friend, Mr. Gary Plants. Hey, Gary. Hey, Scott. How you doing? I am nothing short than fantastic. I'm so glad that you're here with us, joining us. Well, I, I, I saw that uh, Mark Holstein is here. Of course, he's not too far from you. Uh, you're not in Driftwood. You are in what? I am in a little city called Liberty Hill. Liberty Hill. About 35 miles north of Austin. Now, isn't that where C.J. Johnson lives or was from? Yeah. Yes, we're very, yeah. very close. Uh, about probably within 10 miles of each other. Yeah, uh, that's kind of what uh, I was thinking. You guys were, were kind of close up here. Uh, just real quickly, you got uh, Tiffany Allen, who just uh, joined us from uh, North Carolina. And across the road, just uh, speaking of Houston, my buddy, our buddy Kirby Van Birch is here again. So glad that you're here. All right, all right, all right. So what are you drinking right there, Gary? Uh, I have my Diet Coke. Diet Coke. Cheers to you, my friend. Thank <laughs> to you, Scott. Mm. I saw you were talking, you traveled to New Orleans to visit with uh, John Rockerbomber, and maybe we'll get into talking a little bit about that, because I want to hear about some of the conversation on that, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But before we do, we got to bring in then somebody else. Let's bring in then our next guest, who this video will tell you something about him. And there he is. Hey, Mr. Farquhar. Hey, how are you? Cheers. Cheers to you. So, so very glad that you had made it in here then as well. This is uh, great. And I love you even more because you have joined the theme of the show. <laughs> oh, heck, 100%. Vodka you're Martini. My, you're my man. I think you are also perhaps the most uh, awarded and decorated magician I personally know. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a cool claim to fame. I'll take that. <laughs> but I must say, our next guest is someone else who has won and is also the head of the jury for the convention for the FISM. And this will tell you about this guy. Bonjour, there he is. <laughs> Congratulations. Bonjour, everyone. Yes, um, I run up the glasses, so I put my martini in that bottle. So, <laughs> cheers to all of you guys. <clears throat> I know from experience, I'm going to place this over here because I don't want to ruin another keyboard. We've already done that, I think, yeah, <laughs> once too many. Uh, and so, uh, Boris, what time is it over there, by the way? Uh, it's your time. It's about 2 11 a.m. 11. That's pretty, 
pretty <laughs> darn early. So thank you very much for staying up. And one of the things, as I understand it, you actually are going to, you, you after we've been coming out of COVID, you're actually going to be doing crescendo. You're going to be doing picking up where you left off. You had the show going and then it stopped and now you're going to start again or have you started or what's, what's the story on, on that? Yeah, yeah, I was supposed to do uh, the show like several times uh, last year and also including earlier this year at the uh, at the Double Fond, like Dominique Duvivier's place in Paris, the, uh, the Magic Theatre. And um, unfortunately, yes, I could only do it like one time in October 2020. And then tomorrow is the, uh, I would say, reopening and I'm going to perform live again my show tomorrow. So... Yeah, pretty exciting and nervous at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so have you been doing, I know, a lot of uh, uh, these virtual shows uh, as well, because I've seen you all over the, uh, start to say tube, boy, is that old, all over the internet, uh, and, and seeing you do all these uh, different kinds of things for different shows, whether it's been Monday Night Magic uh, or other kinds of things, uh, working with, uh, I think, with Anthony Darkstone, you know, on the international, anyhow, different kinds of virtual shows. How many virtual shows would you say that you've been doing here this year? Uh, I don't know exactly. I mean, the fact I've never, I've never, I've not, I'm sorry, I've, I haven't done any like full virtual show, like an hour show or something, but yeah. I did, um, I did lots of lectures, but I also uh, did some uh, shows where I was part of like Monday Night Magic or the Magic Castle, so uh, with other performers. And I think that was just fun because it was just a good opportunity to, you know, see the other, the other ones, the friends that you usually we meet at conventions, but Right. It was through the camera only, but that that was that was kind of fun, and it allowed me also to work on stuff that I was, you know, not planning to do <laughs> like this way at least virtually. But uh, I learned a lot, so it was just um, an an interesting experience. But now, I mean, going back to live and seeing an audience tomorrow, like you know, in front of you, that's the best feeling in the world, and I just I look forward to it so much. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing like a live show then, certainly. But I eventually want to get back also to uh, talking to you guys, uh, Sean and, and Boris in particular, about your lecture experience virtually. But I want to get over then also to ask you and Sean about your virtual shows, because you've been doing a lot of these. You opened up a theater. I think you opened it just before COVID or right during? Yeah, I opened it in September of 2019 and closed it in March of 2020 and then reopened again in June of 2020 and closed in October of 2020 and opened five weeks ago. Um, in fact, I had a show last night, a buyout uh, corporate client. They were going a hell of skiing and uh, doing this whitewater rafting. But beforehand, they all came to see Hidden Wonders. And one of the audience members hugged me last night. It was so cool. It was like human contact from outside my wife and daughter. It was very neat. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, is that something that you're going to continue then every night or how many nights a week and how often are you going to be doing that? So uh, shows right now are Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. I'll expand to Thursdays, then two on Friday, two on Saturday, a matinee on Sunday and a Sunday evening show. And uh, we pretty much think September, mid-September, about the 15th, uh, British Columbia is going through steps and we're in step number three. When we hit step number four, I can increase the size of my audience to the actual full capacity of my theater which is only 30 people. And uh, uh, then I can actually start making money instead of just paying the landlord. It'll be awesome. What's, what's the name of the website, by the way, where people can go and check out? Hiddenwonders.show or hiddenwonders.ca. It's easy to find. It's a speakeasy. You uh, come in, it looks like a regular store, and then you get given a doorknob and you go find a wall that the doorknob sticks to and the wall opens up and you're in this Victorian lounge and from the lounge into a cute little Victorian theater. So is that right? Hidden Wonders dot S H O W. Yep, absolutely correct. Otherwise, it's not a show. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be a show. It'd be a shoe. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's right. Uh, and is your family involved in getting that all set up and uh, everything? Um, my my daughter is a second year graduate of uh, university in theater, so oh, she was in the design and put everything together. My yeah. wife sewed all the curtains. Uh, uh, Alex and Billy are like my adopted sons. They helped me to hang all the lights and uh, <laughs> uh, saw on. We made all the risers and everything, and we built lots of things that magicians would love into the theater, hidden areas and accesses to things. So it's, uh, it's really quite a delight, uh, right down to, you know, the hidden doors to get in. Now, I know, for an example, going to the House of Cards in Nashville, Tennessee, it also is a speakeasy. In fact, you don't even know the address. You're supposed to park in a parking lot, ask the 
parking attendant, where is the place? They actually point you to it. And then you still have to knock on a door and go either through an elevator or down the steps or something. How difficult is, and, and also of course the Chicago Magic Lounge is a secret to try to find a laundromat to get through there. So how difficult is, is it that you make it for people to get I in? I make it difficult. I want it to be difficult. Okay. Um, the, the address isn't listed. Uh, they only get the address when they buy tickets. And even once they get the address, they get a little confused when they arrive and see there's no theater. Even if they're aware it's gonna be a speakeasy, they, they don't see, it's a full store in the front filled with curious items you know old electric guitars radios and uh, posters and old black and white photographs but to the magician who looks at it they'd recognize you know that the photograph is houdini playing shuffleboard on a, a cruise deck and the crests on the wall are like old pcam or uh, the deck of cards is a magic castle deck of cards spread out inside of a display cabinet uh, so when if you're a magician you'll recognize really quickly wow that's a lot of magic stuff in there even the comic books are like you know mandrake first editions and uh, batman versus houdini uh, it, when they get given the doorknob, I have security cameras in the place, so I get to watch them as they try to find it, and it's really fun. Uh, each gets it as a group experience, and so when they find it, they, they pretty much cheer that they actually get into the lounge. It's, it's sounds really almost fun. like like an escape room. <laughs> it is. It's a reverse escape room. And a reverse escape escape room. Very exactly funny. what it is. <laughs> but none of the stuff is for sale, so you don't have anybody out front and, or anything. Okay. What's hilarious is uh, when the audience is exiting, a lot of people just come in because they're always saying, you know, we come to this store and you never post hours. We saw it was open, so we're coming in. We're, I'm sorry, we're just closing. And I've had people try to buy things. It's like, <laughs> we'd like to buy that. Oh, I'm sorry, that's $900. Well, that's ludicrous. I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> Because I don't want to sell it. Yeah, I don't want to sell anything. They're all memories to me out there. <laughs> so is this something you think you're going to be kind of sliding into as you phase out uh, cruise ships? As yeah. far as kind of going into whatever, you know, the rest of your life. I'm not going to say retirement because none of us actually retire, but a different uh, phase of your life. Yeah, I have, I've wanted to have my own theater for more than 20 years and uh, cruise ship I've loved. I've been doing that for 33 years, but there comes a time to let the young people in and uh, have the old codger step aside. I decided it was about that time. I helped a few young friends get into cruising and they're all doing great. In fact, I was talking to the agent just 20 minutes ago who booked me there and he was you know, complimenting me on my students that I've given him and how great they're doing, how just not as performers, but as human beings, they're great, which is a really nice compliment. That's great, that's great. Uh, Gary, we uh, had a question also from someone here a little bit earlier that had asked, uh, can, uh, Jerry had asked this about, well, we can see some of the frame stuff in your magic room over there. <laughs> uh, my magic rooms, I'd have to, it would be very difficult to do. However, I did uh, I did pull some photographs from uh, one of my albums. If uh, I can, yeah, show you a few of those. If you want, I've got. Uh, I would. Now that's one of the things too I wanted to talk with you about because you have had some just uh, incredible pictures that you have been posting on Facebook from time to time of uh, magicians from the past, uh, and uh, I mean like not just Vernon but a lot of others. I mean I have uh, one of my own. In fact, it's a little favorite that I don't think you have seen before. Like this one. Uh, uh, I have seen that, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> At what? I, I, I have seen that before. That's uh, that's a that's a couple of years ago, I guess. Uh, I think it may have been. Yes. So you and Eric DeCamps and Bill Kalush, for those that's who are wondering. Right. That's right. <laughs> and I believe that was possibly taken in New Orleans. Uh, I, I think uh, that's. I believe that you're right. At the SAM convention. Yes. 2000. Yes. In 2000 was it, Sean? Okay. Yeah. There you go. That was kind of fun. I'm sorry. So, yes, I would like to see some other pictures. If you can share something, that'd be cool. Okay. You tell me when to stop. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a big Paul Rosini fan. Yeah. So this was this. The, what's special about this is uh, if you look, you can see who it's autographed to. Fred Browie. Fred uh -huh. Browie. Uh -huh. So if you're a card guy, you know, that's a, that's a cool picture to have. Uh, I've got a couple of others. There he is uh, with... Uh, I guess I'm too close. Yeah. Cups and balls over here. He's doing a thumb tie. And then uh, a good dear friend uh, from years ago, uh, Michael Skinner. Michael Skinner. Back in uh, the 80s. I took this photograph and then took it and had Slavini sign it. I took that. Oh, out. wow. So that's a. That's Those look I'm, like the uh, silks that uh, Palmer Magic sells. Yeah. They are. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, we all know uh, from all of us being up at Fector's, there's an autographed Eddie Fector. Eddie. 
picture to, uh, I think, uh, Lou, Lou Berg. I don't know if that's supposed to be Joe, but it says Lou Berg. Uh, so there's Eddie. Uh, autographed Jimmy Griffo. Oh, wow. On the, uh, on the uh, other side. This used to hang up in the Forks Hotel. Is it, anybody know who that is? <laughs> that's Mike. Yeah, Michael yeah, Skinner. Early Mike Skinner. Yeah. And he autographed that. That used to hang right in the uh, restaurant at the Forks. Uh, wait, there's a nice uh, uh, Johnny Mohammed, Platt or Mohammed Bay. Oh, Mohammed Bay. Mohammed Bay. Yeah, it's one of the stars of Magic. Uh, Clark Crandall. And, oh, Senator. Yeah, here's a nice one. I picked this up on eBay a long time ago. Look at this, uh, Carl Ballantyne. Oh my gosh! Oh wow, he looks like a kid. He yeah, does, doesn't he? This, this was uh, <laughs> 1943, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how old he was at that at that point in time. Uh, this is one autographed uh, to uh, by Francis Carlyle, and then uh, there's a better photograph of Francis. It's autographed. I try to get him autographed if I can. Of course, we got the professor doing a lecture. He's doing his cards to pocket. I think that's an. You probably have a lot of uh, a professor, don't you? I have probably more of him than anybody else. Paul LaPaul, autographed Paul mm -hmm. LaPaul. I have I have several of him. I collect. I've got probably a half a dozen. There's another mm -hmm. one. And then I have. Uh, speaking of Slidini, I don't want to go too far here. I'll show you one or two more because I know you don't have much time. There's a, a nice shot of Slidini teaching uh, some of his. Who's students. at the table there with him? Oh. Uh, I do not know. I believe the guy, what would be uh, uh, the second from the right. Uh, oh heck, I can't. Re I can't remember his name. But look at the look at the portrait of uh, Slidini there in the back, which is really yeah. Nice. And then there's another one, uh, another uh, where he's been. I don't know if he's giving a show or lessons or what there. But I have. I have several of those let me see if there's anything else i can't there's there's a not very nice one of sladini doing the you know, i often wonder when i see those kinds of photos if they were just set up they were they were just kind of hanging out at a magic convention i mean how they all get together at one time you know and all dressed up like that look like they just all came from a show well that's you know that's the way people used to dress yeah so you know you, you, you used to be you go to a uh back in the 40s and 50s every man had a hat on uh, it wasn't unusual, you know, at that point in time. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, I've been I've been uh, working on framing. I had I've had posters for forty years, and they've always been rolled up in tubes or in boxes. <laughs> and I finally decided I'm going to die. I'm going to die, and they're never going to make it on the wall. So uh, <laughs> so it'll be easier for you to them ship them to my house, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a project I've been on for about the last month. Is uh, framed a bunch of posters and trying to find places for those. And when you say try and find places for them. Uh, that is uh, true because I am I've been running out of room on my walls and the, the posters I want to put up mean I've got to take something down and then store that, you know, I just I mean, they're if I were to show you this, they're buttered up against each other, uh, <laughs> all three stories. And, you know, from well, they're not in my bedroom. Kathy had said, OK, we're going to have one place that we're not going to have magic. And it's just kind of crept in a little bit, but uh, not as bad. <laughs> you can probably relate to me, Sean, to what I'm talking about there. <laughs> uh, but I did have about 45 of my pictures, uh, posters framed that I was going to be taking down the Magic Island since they'd lost all of those. And they did get framed. They're beautiful. And as it turned out, long story short, they're probably not going to open the Magic Island. There's less than a 1% chance that will happen. So mm -hmm. I've still got those, uh, you know, just stacked up in my closet right mm -hmm. now. So. Um, but some of them I had uh, taken actually to a new place that's going up in Oklahoma. There's a new place in Locust Grove, Oklahoma, a new magic uh, venue that will be opening uh, later this year. We'll talk about that at some later time over there. Uh, Boris, so are you a collector, Boris, of much uh, stuff? I mean, most magicians collect all kinds of stuff. Do you collect playing cards? I mean, I know right now cards are really big where everyone has like a Kickstarter or something to, for new cards or something. And of course, you've got your own cards with the uh, Boris Wild uh, readers or just the, uh, the Mark deck. But uh, aside, aside from, I mean, you don't collect those, you sell those. You don't want to keep them. You want to sell those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, and those are uh, Phoenix cards, aren't they? Not Phoenix, but uh, yeah, yeah, they're Phoenix cards, aren't they? Yeah. 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 So yes. They, they were like uh, Bicycle Rider back first and Maiden and then they're available in Phoenix. Right. So, but yeah, do you I collect don't... anything? 
Uh, yeah, I, 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 some, several years ago, I started to collect cards. And I started with the Black Tigers, I remember, because they were like huge when they came out. And then there were like a few more and more. And I think they realized that, you know, those kind of decks were like become very, became very and more popular with time. And they released more and more. And at some point I was like, uh, you know what, that's, uh, yeah, there's like 10, 10 new decks every day. <laughs> I mean, I can't keep up with that. It's just, that's too much. So yeah, but I have my little cabinet here and I just, um, I collect like lots of little figurines from Magic. So I got lots of like Mickey's and, and, and like, I, I don't know, all kind of cartoon character. I mean, I got a Pink, Pan a Pink Panther like a few days ago. Uh, Zatanna, of course, and so I got like all kinds of little figurines. So I love that. I mean, usually you go to flea market. My dad goes to flea markets too, and whenever he sees like a little figurine that has a top hat or you know a rabbit or magic wand or something related to magic, go straight to the cabinet. So now I have like a few hundreds of them, <laughs> and they're just there. And I, well, when we um, when we go to Fism, often there are a lot of magic dealers who are there, and many times they will have some artists who have little figurines and things for sale. I'm trying to think of the the two guys who uh, are a magic act. Sean, you can probably or, or Forrest help me with their name. Uh, oh, Fabrini, Vic and Fabrini, Vic and Fabrini. Yes. Yeah. Do you have this, Boris? Uh, oh, I have. I don't have this one with the bottles, but I have the. I have one in the same uh, family. I would say he's got a, a, a top hat and a silk coming. He's a, a Spanish uh, artist. It just yeah. so cute. Exactly. Yeah, I have one of these. Uh, one of this collection here, but I, it's sometimes it's just uh, way too much. I don't remember. Many <laughs> figurines to keep track of. I got that little guy too. He's doing. Oh yes. The That's rope. cute. That's the cute. rope. Love it. Nice. Okay. I need to go to your place and just. More figurines. Uh, you can come over and collect them anytime you want to, brother. <laughs> Thank you, more, brother. I'm sitting yeah. on the shelf waiting for you. <laughs> uh, Gary, the pictures that you have the, that are all the signed photos and everything, I assume you had gotten most of those uh, from through Potter and Potter, or you mentioned eBay uh, from time to time. You, how do you come across those? Are there certain things you're looking for? Or you have keywords that are out there and then they trigger and let you know when they're available or something or. Uh, I've, I've been on eBay since it started. So I got some uh, very, very good deals and some not so good deals, but I still got them uh, off of eBay. But yeah, Potter and Potter, I buy a, a lot of pictures from them. Uh, you know, any, anywhere I see one, if, if it's for sale on the internet, I just bought three today. Uh, two autographed Jay Marshalls and a, uh, uh, who was the, oh, uh, shoot, uh, from up, Sid Lorraine. Got a, oh. I got a signed Sid Lorraine and two Jay Marshalls that I bought today. So I'm always glad. I've got a, these notebooks that you see back here. Um, yeah. most, most of those, the, all of those notebooks are either photographs or letters. Uh, oh. That's another thing that I like to collect is letters. Those red notebooks are uh, letters that were written to Alan Akawa uh, by people, magicians since the 70s. Uh, Ross Bertram, Mike Skinner, Vernon, Fawcett Ross, you know, on and on and on and on. So uh, we worked a deal. I, I gave him a, sent him a book and he sent me all the letters. And, and so I'm very happy to have those. But almost all, almost all those notebooks other than the red ones are, uh, are all photographs. I know, of course, that Mike Caveney uh, saves a lot of letters, collects those things, and they publish a lot of them in Magic Magazine, then later came out with a book on that. Speaking of Jay Marshall, I have a, a signature of his that I cherish, but I don't know where it is. I cherish it so much, it's lost. Uh, it, was, it was following one of the IBM conventions, uh, and Mike Close was playing the piano for him. He was doing Lefty, and the show was over. I was backstage. And we just threw away the, the sheet music from If I Had My Way. Well, I, I fished it out and asked uh, Jay when we were backstage if he would sign this. And he drew a little picture of Lefty on there and signed it to Scott. And it's like, this is great. I came back home and I put it in something. And I cannot to this day find it. And I have searched high and low. And I keep thinking I'm going to run across it sometime, press between something, maybe in a you know, brochure or maybe in the convention souvenir program. Or, I have no idea. But I, in my mind, I know what it looks like. So it's like as if I still have it. <laughs> think, think, think how happy you'll be when you do run across it, though. Oh, it'll be a joyful day. <laughs> the pearl of great value. You can't remember. 
What's that? Safe place. That safe place that you just can't remember. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, I wanted to mention also, we're talking about cards. And Gary, you are a card, not sorry to say a mechanic. A mechanic actually fixes things and you fix things. But I want, I, I, a, card a card mechanic is different than what most laymen think of as a mechanic. Uh, they, a mechanic, uh, a magician is someone who's going to be able, of course, to handle cards properly. Uh, and in a, uh, uh, a way so as not to for other people not to see uh, what, what they're doing. But a mechanic fixing a car fixes things. And you also fix cards. And you had a company called the Card Plant for a long time. And people had asked about that. If that was still around, you were saying that you had dissolved that website uh, some time ago. And now it's just like custom orders only if you want to. I mean, you're, you're in a nice position where you work, you make what you want for who, when you want. Is that pretty much it? Uh, I really am not making anything. When, when I moved uh, from about uh, four years ago uh, from the Houston area up to the Austin area, and uh, I, I've been making cards for like 20 years. And, uh, you know, I, I had other things I wanted to do. There was, uh, I got involved with other things. So I didn't even set up shop. The only thing that I do still make and sell from time to time is I'll get a, if I get enough orders, I'll make up a dozen of the uh, magnetized cards, which is uh, quite popular. Now that's not magnetic cards. It's a, it's a trick where the cards stick to the palm of your hand. And uh, I do sit, I enjoy making those and I'll sit down and make those up, but no, I'm not taking any really special orders or anything. I've got, I've got other things that I want to do at this point now. So. Yeah. Uh, and so what are those, some, what are some of those things that you're doing with your time? Uh, well, I am framing these posters, I guess, for one <laughs> posters, right? I'm, I, I wanted to sit down and I used to love coming up with my, with uh, original card routines and, uh, that took up so much of my time. I didn't have much time to do that. So I've been spending a lot of time coming up with, uh, you know, some, some card tricks and, uh, well, I know also you have uh, developed and worked with uh, Zero Shuffle so much that you've got a lot of work on that, and you sell a DVD personally. It's not available, I guess, through through dealers officially, but it is through you. And uh, uh, and I know that all of us knew Herb Zero, and he used to attend the 4F convention all the time, and we were uh, knew him uh, well. But uh, how was it that – did you show him your method or your, your finesses on that before he passed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I sat I sat with Herb uh, up at Vectors uh, just about every year. We would sit down and do tricks, and uh, I, I asked him to show me his shuffle, and I showed him my thoughts on it, and he, you know, he he appreciated uh, what I had uh, come up with, and uh, yeah, I do. I, that's another thing. I do have I don't know how many a stack a stack of DVDs left. I do sell it as a finally converted it to a digital download, but. Uh, you know, it's funny. Let me let me read this just real quick. One second. You know, I've told you I collect letters. And, it's okay. It gives uh, me a chance to pour another martini. Okay. This this is a letter. I, I think uh, as magicians, you'll find this interesting. This was written in 1994 by a magician named Jack Dean. Uh, uh, he wrote it to Barry Richardson, and I found this quite interesting because it's exactly uh, what I thought about the the way most magicians perform the zero shuffle. Uh, he wrote, I'm picking up like on the second page, it says, speaking of false shuffles, I'm always amused at these card experts who state that you can't see a thing when you do a zero shuffle. Baloney. They say this, and then they do the shuffle, and it always looks as if they did something fakey. The spectators may not know what they did or how they did it, but they do know that they did something tricky and that it wasn't a clean, fair shuffle. I've seen several top card men do the zero shuffle, and it always looked tricky. These guys are fooling themselves, as so many magicians do, when they don't give the audience any credit for intelligence. So often the performer thinks that he gets away with it when the audience is really just too polite to say otherwise. And uh, I, 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 when I read that, I thought, well, that's pretty much how I always felt whenever I saw the zero shuffle done. So that's when I started to work on it and see about trying to fix some of the tails. So. 
Yeah, I uh, I think that is uh, pretty good. Any, any thoughts on that, Sean, as to what they said there or, or Boris? Yeah, I agree 100% with it. The very first time I attended uh, Vectors, I was sitting at one of the breakout tables uh, trying to do the, the zero shuffle. I suck at it. And the guy walked by, looked down and said, that's probably the worst zero shuffle I've ever seen. I said, thanks for the encouragement. I really appreciate it. You know, if you have a couple of tips, if not, I really, and he was like, oh, no. And he sat down for the next half an hour. I didn't realize it was Herb Zero. <laughs> and he was very kind to me. And at the end, I saw how nice it looked in his hands and decided I would do a different fake shuffle. That's what I decided. <laughs> <laughs> Too often the magicians are fooling themselves so they don't credit the audience with enough intelligence and, and, and having those little finesses that can work it to make it stronger. Anything that a person creates, if they think it's done when it's created, I think that's wrong. I think you create something, then you give it to other people, and in their hands, they find nuances and, and little touches that will make it stronger. If the creator was against that, that would be insane because there's only growth in our industry, right, from learning from each other. Exactly. That's true. I remember at one of the Fector's uh, conventions, we were uh, listening to Boris give a, an excellent, one of his many excellent lectures, and it was about the kiss count. And I was sitting next to... Um, oh, his wife's name was Happy, uh, and he wor she worked for uh, Ace Greenberg. Uh, Bob Elliott. Bob Elliott, thank you very much. So Bob Elliott was sitting next to me, and I was doing this, and he said, that's not the same thing Boris has done. I think you've invented something different. <laughs> <laughs> As he was doing it, I was kind of, it's like you're doing something in a mirror, and it's different from what they, they're actually doing. And he said, no, it's different than that. I don't remember what I was doing now, but that was a nice count. I've not... Fiddled with that sense over there. So, <laughs> any thoughts then, uh, Boris, on, uh, on yeah, how you want to change things? No, that's very true. I mean, that's usually how we start, you know, working on stuff and then we uh, either accidentally or not doing something different. And then uh, you, we show that to someone and the guy's like, hey, that's okay. That's interesting. Like, Factors is just a, it's, it's a wonderful, it's just such a creative factory, I would say, when you're there because. Uh, yeah, someone shows you something and it makes you think of something else or you try to do the thing again like you did with my account and then you realize you come up with something or or the best thing is like, yes, I remember, you know, seeing Herb Zaro and the first time I was at Factors, I was asked to lecture pretty much without notice because somebody was supposed to lecture, it didn't show up. So Obi said, Hey, you're on. <laughs> so in an hour, you do right. lecturing. It's like, oh crap. And <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm not ready, but I will be, because you have to be ready. It's for it's for us. And I just remember that I was just the first row. I was looking around, and I see everyone. Sean like, was there. Everybody was there. I was like, and I'm like, oh my god. I mean, would you pick a car, Mr. Emsley? Oh, Emsley. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. Emsley, yeah. and, and, and and Herb Zaro. I knew the name of you, but I. I I've never met him. I didn't know who was, he was looking like. And then it's only when I came to him and I'm like, Herb Z Zaro, Z Zaro? Like, okay, no. Um, so I was like, is there anybody normally in this audience so I can have someone to select the car, please? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's amazing. That's where you can, you know, see. And I remember also Herb Zaro, there was this young kid first time there. And he was like bored. He just he didn't really know about everything about 4F. And, but he was just so natural. And he just went to see Herb Zaro. And it's like, I'm sorry, I'm just really struggling with the move. And no, no, no. It's like, sure. And like, Herb Zaro just stood up, turned his chair, put his, you know, he was kneeing on the floor and just taking the decks and putting his hand over the kid's de uh, hands. And he was just showing him, you know, his shuffle. And you're like, oh my God, where do you see that? <laughs> Anywhere else now. That's really what that whole brotherhood is about, I think, with the 4F, that it's really amazing. I have a similar story that all of you guys do. I was sitting at the Forks Bar one time, and I was showing this old guy <laughs> this uh, trick. And um, uh, then he said, well, let me show you the way I invented it. You know, And then he started doing it. You know, And I thought, wait a minute. You know, this was... Uh, this is called Dave's Delight. And I looked at his name tag. It was Dave Letterman. You know, so yeah. he was he was Dave of Dave, Dave's Delight who had invented it. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, here I am showing this guy what I think is a is a cool trick, a new trick. <laughs> and, and so was, yeah. 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 And he was really nice. He said, Well, here's another, here's my handling on that, you know, from the original. It's kind of nice <laughs> to, to go back. And the way that all these guys have uh, been very helpful, you know, through the years and all that. Um uh, do you have yeah. Uh did you ever see my, uh, him do, uh, Dave Lederman do uh, Max Landano's Eternal Thread from the Stars of Magic series? 
No, I did not. Boy, oh boy, was it just, uh, it was one of the most magical things I ever saw. Uh, if you, you can find it, it's Max, Max Landano. And uh, he took out this little pill bottle and unscrewed the top. And inside were all these little tiny pieces of thread. And he reaches in and he pulls out all those little pieces. And he just kind of wiggles them around in his hand like this. And then he grabs them. And then it's like gypsy thread. They all go together. And then, and then he gives them a little squeeze like this and, and then puts them back in the box piece by piece. They go back in the little pill bottle. Oh, and wow. And you're instantly reset uh, to perform that. You know, you go to, a, you could do a table hopping. Everything is wow. right there inside the little pill bottle. It's a fantastic fact. He's the only magician that I've ever seen perform it. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. Max Landano, it was in the set, not the original Stars of Magic, but the, uh, the second set, you know, that they put, put out in the leaf. So it's worth looking up if you. If yeah. You're yeah. With it. I love that idea. So you don't have to tear the things apart. Plus, it goes back the way that you had it. It's reset and everything. So, wow, that is pretty cool. Well, at the moment you said already reset. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Always looking for that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's right. Uh, and so we're talking about dealers a little bit uh, ago then as well. And I wanted to ask you then about, and you probably told the story several times, and I think even on my podcast uh, one time, Sean, about how you came across with, uh, or got to be friends with Palmer Tilden and about Palmer Magic and how you had uh, uh, gotten rights to that and what it was and why. Would you tell that story? Yeah. Um, I, I was a, a student of Jerry Anderson. When Jerry passed away, I wanted you know, some way to keep Jerry's name alive. And I thought of all the effects, the one that really needed to be out there was the Omni deck. And so I went to this company, Palmer Magic, and met Palmer Tilden and said, I want to be able to wholesale them. I started selling some and, and it was difficult to do. So I asked him if I could change part of it. And I talked to Jerry's best friend, Ray Hyman. And I said, do you think Jerry'd be offended? And he said, no, I think Jerry would want it to be in everybody's hands. So we changed a little bit. And Palmer was nice and started making them for me. And within a couple of years, Palmer said, you know, you're my best customer. I've sold more Omni decks in the last two years than I did in the last 10. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then one day Palmer said, I think I'm going to retire. He wasn't well. And uh, he said, uh, would you like to buy the company? And I said, yeah, but I can't afford it. And he said, well, come up with a number. And I sat down, worked on it for a long time, looked at the inventory because he has everything. He had, you know, a uh, card on ceiling from Michael Lamar. Uh, screwed deck from Paul Harris, Bob Koch's telekinetic timber, slidingy silks, everything. And I was like, I, I just can't afford it. So I came up with a price just for the Omni deck and thought I'd approach him. And before I even get a price out, he said, no, I, I don't want to sell it off in little pieces. I, I want to sell the company. And about four months went by, he phoned me. I was on my way to the IBM convention. We were in Long Beach and he said, I found a buyer. I'll give you the guy's name and maybe he'll sell you the one piece. And I was like, can I ask how much you know, you're selling it for? And when he told me the price, it was 5000 less than what I was going to offer him for the Omni deck. <laughs> and I was like, oh, have you signed any paperwork worth of it? He's like, no. I said, good, then don't. Uh, I'll give you $5,000 more and uh, sweeten the pot. I'll guarantee to keep it the name Palmer Magic as long as you're alive. And he was like, really? I said, yeah. I mean, it's your legacy. He's passed a long time ago, and I still keep it Palmer Magic. He was such a clever man to you know, convince so many artists to give him their material, uh, but he treated it with respect. Uh, everything that's in the Palmer Magic catalog, I wanted as a kid. And now I've got hundreds of them. It's, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, I never dreamed that I'd have it. It's like, I got garages full of it. <laughs> well, now, as I understand, one of the more difficult things was to try to find the right kind of parachute material, because it's not just Ooh. parachute material. And once those yards were gone, uh, material that uh, Tony Slidini had, they were gone. But uh, did Palmer have some other blessed. supplier or what are you using? So, so in his notes, he had these, now we had a whole bunch of them, like 40 or 50 sets of them. And I really didn't know what I had because I wasn't a big student of Slidini's magic or anything. I never met the man and I have his books and everything, but uh, I took a few uh, to the IBM convention as a dealer and they were, people were buying like five and six of them. And I was like, well, no, no, you can buy one. And it was like, why? Well, I said, I want some on my table. The one guy came over and said, I'll buy all of them. I'm like, no, you can buy whatever's left at the end. If there is, there won't be any left. And I was like, I had no idea what I had. So then I went through my notes looking and I found this lady's number and I phoned her in California and I said, hi, my name is Sean. I bought Palmer Magic. She said, oh, Palmer said you would call one day. I'm the lady who sews them. I'm like, oh, awesome. She was in her 70s at the time. And I said, uh, I need some more sewing. Uh, you need to tell me where to get the material. I said, I have two more bolts still here that uh, Mr. Slidini had left. And I was like, 
what? So I had two complete bolts of material. So that took a couple of years, like almost four years to deplete. And while it was being depleted, I asked her to find on the ends of the, of the rolls our code numbers. And so I went looking for the code numbers and it took us about two years to find the actual original suppliers. And I contacted them and said, we don't make that anymore. We make it with like a golden tinge. So I bought a roll of the golden tinge and I didn't like it. And I said, can I return it? And they're like, yeah. And they said, we found three more rolls of the old stuff sitting in the back. Did you want those? I'm like, yes, please. I'll take all of them. <laughs> then I phoned the lady, Angela, and I said, uh, I've got more. I'm having them delivered directly to you. She goes, oh, that's good. And I said, you can just start making them. She said, well, how many do you want? And I said, um, I don't want to be rude, but you're almost 80 at this point. I said, you're, you're, you're in your early 80s. Just keep sewing, please. Just keep sewing. <laughs> <laughs> my wife has tried so, she's not so very many, good at it. so how many did you get from her i still she's still making them she's uh her daughter is now making them for her and she uh, watches her daughter it's a special footing to make the flat and everything on them and she, her daughter is doing just as well we waited to see if we'd see a change and we didn't see a change so we're very happy other than that or angela's 90 and still sewing them but i think her daughter's doing them now <laughs> maybe um, she's doing quality control or just checking before they go out the door I think that's what it is. And Angela is very good about it. Uh, and she sends us the ones that aren't perfect. And we put those aside as ones for practice silks for people who want to try and things like that, who aren't willing to invest in it. Um, they usually go to, there's a school in Spain and there's a magician there and he'll buy all the seconds knowing that they're seconds so students can practice with them. But the material is really amazing. I've seen all the others. Now I'm actually kind of an aficionado from having looked at all of them. And I, I know what an amazing product I have. It, it's like I have the, the rights to Slidini pins, but um, the ones we sell are a smaller version. And I put right in it smaller and I have them very lowly priced because the effect is brilliant, but Slidini with gold pins and there's so much better. And I would love to produce the gold pins, but they have to be the right material. And I haven't been able to find it because they just stopped making pins like that. Are the Slidini pins different from Jerry Andrus's? Uh, totally pins? different. A totally different method. To be absolutely honest, Jerry's method is so much better. But I recently learned it's not Jerry's method. Uh, Jerry put out a book with like 50 tricks, but the, the special pin that was used in Jerry's routine was actually written up in Phoenix. And Jerry credits, credits it in the book when you get pin tricks. He credited it. And I was reading through the book. I have like 40 copies of the book. One that actually has my name written through it. Jerry made a book for me. But I was looking through it just a few weeks ago. And I glanced over this mention of a pin and I went, and he says Phoenix. So I went back and I looked at him, oh my God, it's in there. So uh, the full description of how to make it in everything is available in Phoenix. Wow. Well, sometimes those descriptions are available elsewhere. And I'm referring now, like, let's say to the magnetized card, even though you know how to make it, the way that yeah. Harry makes those cards, they are imperceptible. You know, in fact, I had done that. I have a, my own presentation for magnetized cards. I did at the Magic Castle. And one time there was a guy said, I'm a hand surgeon. Can I look at your hands to see? I want to see if there was actually a magnet built in that you had in your hand. <laughs> like, oh, nice. You. <laughs> he was yeah. absolutely serious. He was looking and feeling. <laughs> so well made, well made, my friend. <laughs> you know, I was, I was the one thing that I'm proudest of, uh, enough about that is when I, Roger Klaus was the one that put me on that. He wanted me to make the old version with a, with a needle that you stuck Ooh. in the skin. Yeah. And it's not that, you know, I don't do that type of work. So he says, well, come up with something. And so I used to make the cigarette through card. And one night I had made a couple of those and I was, I had gone to bed and I, and I uh, was laying there thinking about the magnetized card. And, I, and then all of a sudden it hit me, you know, that, wow, if I just forget the cigarette through and just make the flap. So that's how it came into to being. And then uh, I sent, uh, uh, as soon as I made them up and packaged them, I sent one to Ricky J and I sent one to Steve Freeman. And uh, about two weeks later, I get a phone call from Ricky and he says, you know, uh, Gary, I've always wanted to to put this in one of my shows and uh, I've never had a method that I really liked. And he says, I think that you've come up with the best method there is. And he wanted to put it in his show on the stem. And so uh, he says, well, what can we what kind of deal can we work out? And I said, well, <laughs> I said, we don't need a deal. I'm, I would be honored. And so uh, I made up you know, all these cards that he used for uh, performing on the stem and got to go up to New York and, and see the show and then got to, to go out to dinner with him afterwards. And it was very nice, but that's probably my, my biggest uh, uh, acclaim in magic. I'm, I was so happy that that worked out. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, you as we, as we started into this, and I introduced you, I didn't really mention, but I, for those people who are watching who don't know Gary, uh, that's because he is really one of these underground guys. I mean, it used to be, of course, that Mike Skinner and and uh, I guess Alan Ackerman and uh, 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 Roger Klaus and a lot of these guys were under what they call underground magicians that kind of got to have more notoriety and fame. And you're one of those guys who just come up with great ideas and everyone, all, all the real magicians like Boris and Sean, I know, have great respect for you and your skills and everything. And so it's one of those things that you just got to know the right guy. You're kind of a magician's magician. And uh, whereas you have not, you've been doing cruise ships and doing some things uh, like this finally for the public. I think when Jamie Salinas and I were doing our um, our productions here in Houston, we'd hired you as one of the first times I think you'd work for the public. And I guess you decided, hey, it wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> yeah, I used to. I used to always be be known as a magician's magician because that's all I ever did. I would go to a convention at Factors and and I'd come up with a half a dozen routines that would fool magicians and that's yeah. all I, that's all I ever performed for were ma other magicians for uh, most of my life. And then after I retired, uh, thought somebody asked me if I wanted to do a regular you know regular show and I thought well uh, you know why not? And uh, it's so totally different. It's such an yeah. amazing experience and so. One thing led to another, and, and like I said, after I was retired, I got a, a chance to do some uh, uh, cruise ship magic and then some private parties, and, and uh, it's, just been, it's just been wonderful. Someone had just asked a few minutes ago, and I'm, and uh, then I'm going to move on, but uh, are you going to be doing cruises again? I can't find that uh, question, but someone had asked, are you going to be picking that up and doing those again? Uh, someday. I've had three canceled. Even the one, I had one over Christmas this year, and it got canceled about a week ago. Uh, so, you know, uh, eventually if everything goes right, yes, uh, who knows when with the way, uh, the COVID's building back up again, uh, they just canceled a lot of stuff, uh, here in Austin, we were going to go to a music venue and they've just closed it down. So thing, you know, things are getting bad again. Uh, who knows what it's going to be like, Sean, I hope your, I hope your, uh, show place stays open because things are not, we're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, Canada's doing really, we're at, uh, what they say, 54% of our country is double vax now, 79% have their first shot. And my province uh, over the weekend only had 54 cases. Uh, so we're, we're, we've we're been taking it a little bit more straight up, let's do this. Uh, we went through, I was closed for 10 months, you know, staring at the walls. So <laughs> we paid our dues and hopefully... I, I loved uh, in France, uh, your leader's comment the other day was just amazing. Uh, Mitterrand talked about uh, from the land of Louis Pascal and, you know, that people are refusing it with science. I was like, oh, I love this man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've got a question, by the way, uh, Boris, about whether you're, how long you're going to be doing your show Crescendo, by the way. And I'll explain why in just a second. <laughs> we, I mean, we're just doing a, like a soft reopening here. I got like more dates coming up in uh, September, October. So uh, they are they are doing like some kind of like a rotation between like their own shows from the team and like uh, people from you know uh, outside. Like we have like David Stone and uh, Laurent Beretta, myself. So we got like a few uh, a few other guys like you know doing like every other week. Uh, so, um, yeah, so hopefully, um, I don't know, again, I mean, the COVID is hitting us like here with like a, a fourth wave and it's getting, it was getting okay until like a few weeks ago and now it's getting a little worse. So fingers crossed. So uh, we can just keep going the way we're, we can do show right now, uh, which is still with restrictions and the mask and everything, but at least live shows again. So yeah, right now, July, September, October, and then hopefully it, it would just go on. But we're taking it like little by little now because it's very hard to plan a far in advance. Yeah, my question was whether on. you might be doing it still into November or not. You don't know at this point? Uh, yeah, I think so. It, it, that was originally the plan last year. And of course, we had to move all the dates here like this fall and winter. But uh, yes, definitely this is, uh, this is something that's going to happen. The reason I'm asking is because like I'm actually... Year. I'm going to be coming to uh, France uh, in uh, in late November, 
So okay. I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, coming uh, flying into Paris, but then going down to Avignon and then uh, taking a river up to a boat up to uh, uh, Lyon, and then coming on the, about the 18th through the 21st. And I want to spend my birthday uh, in in Paris. So I thought I could see you and David Stone and some of the guys uh, cool. here in some of the guys while I'm up there. And I'd love to see your show or somebody who's working and so we'll hang out that, for a few that days. Would be awesome. Yeah, what I know I have like a you doing? in November, but yes, I, I should be around. So and if if there's no uh, show uh, schedule, we're going to do a private show for you. <laughs> yeah. This is the double phone, right, Boris? Yes, that's oh, the double wow. phone. Yes. Awesome. So, so uh, yeah, that's what cruise line it was. I'm just curious. Is it Viking Cruise Lines by chance? It's not a Viking. Okay. No. Okay. Just wanted no. to ask. Yeah. I know they do a lot out of France. <laughs> no, this is actually a. Uh, it's going to be a wine cruise where we're going to be comparing, believe it or not, Texas wines to French wines. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> so there are a lot of Texans who are going to be coming. I'm going to be traveling with uh, Trixie Bonner, her husband, Mark, and another buddy of mine here, uh, Dick Olson, who many of you uh, know that oh, also. Awesome. So we'll be having a, a, a good time. Um, so um, anyhow, uh, I was, uh, let's see, we've started to wrap up over here at the end of the hour. But before we do, I really want to talk a little bit about uh, FISM coming up then, too, which is going to be into this next year. And as I understand it, there are going to be some uh, competitions prior to that, which have been delayed. Uh, Sean or Boris, can either of you tell us about kind of what's happening as far as those competitions and will be leading up to uh, FISM in Quebec? I could probably lead that off. Uh, FISM has the Continental Championships. They just took place in Europe, and mm -hmm. now we have to have the Continental Championships in North America. So the end of September, the first few days of October, in Quebec City, in the same city where FISM is going to be held in 2022, this year, the last couple of days of September, 1st of October, is going to be the FISM North American Championship. And that's where anybody from North America who wants to compete in the World Championship must go to compete uh, for an opportunity for a slot to compete in the world championship. And so uh, members of the Academy of Magical Arts, the uh, IBM, the SAM, uh, Club de Magie from Quebec, uh, the CAM, uh, the International Brotherhood of Magicians, they all will go to this convention in just a couple of months and compete. And then uh, they will be granted slots. And then next year in 2022, that's when FISM, the world will take place. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And... What uh, are you going to be involved with that, Boris, as far as the judging goes on that continental level or not? Uh, I don't know exactly yet. Like FISM Europe just uh, yeah just finished, as, as uh, Sean said. So, um, yeah, they've managed to they, they postponed like several times, but they still managed to to do it. And so we got uh, like several like French people awarded going to Quebec next year, which we're very happy with along with some really good, uh, really good acts from Europe. So looking forward to seeing them in Quebec next year on stage. And um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in touch with the, uh, with the organizers for a few years now. And um, so since like Busan in 2018, when the uh, last visit happened. And uh, so yeah, when talk, so maybe uh, we have like plans to make some maybe special events because the idea of FISM is just always to try to do something different something special because everybody goes to FISM and they all know okay it's going to be like lectures during the day and then we're going to see the stage competition and close-up competition there'll be galas at night and shows and stuff so uh, but I know that the organizers uh, of the FISM next year really want to you know push the, the bar a little further and just make some special events so they, um, they consulted me and asked me about a few things so we'll see how it goes it's still a year from now and um, so, um, yeah, but I'll be there. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, I, that sounds like it's, it's going to be great. Do you know either of you uh, as to who will be trying to compete for winning the bid to get the next FISM, which I guess is going to be, are they going to get back on schedule? I mean, we we're supposed to be every three years and then they, now it's four. We're going to go have it like two years from now, or is it going to be skip that and go back three years? Anybody know? That's a really great question. I don't think the FISM Presidium has a, a solid plan at the moment for that. I hope they just go three years after because it takes me about three years to save up enough money to go to FISM. <laughs> <laughs> if they only gave me two years, it'd be very expensive. I'm pretty sure Spain will probably make a bid because they lost the bid to Ken in the last one. They had a great bid too, but they they uh, didn't win the bid. So I'm pretty sure they'll probably come back. And 
there's lots of places to do it. And we haven't been to Europe in a while because we went Busan to Canada. So now it's time to go back to Europe to keep this international. Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Any any thoughts on that, Boris? I know you have nothing in that, of course. I mean, it's all just a <laughs> bid. Yeah, from what I yeah, from what I know, I think it's gonna be uh, in the next uh, in in three years, so like in twenty twenty five. Uh, I've heard a few European cities were um, were thinking about hosting FISM, so uh, like nothing totally official yet. And I will you know let them talk about this first. <laughs> yeah. But um, but I think yes. I mean that's as Sean said. I mean it's been. It's great. It was in Asia and it's in um, the American continent. And I think it's it will probably go back to Europe. Even if I know that Tim Ellis that we uh, we 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 talked about earlier yeah, said one day we'd love to go to uh, yeah to bring FISM to Oceania one day, like in Melbourne and Sydney, that would be awesome. But it's one of the first times it's ever been in North America, isn't it? It's the first time. Yep. It's never been to Australia either. It's pretty much always been Europe, twice to Asia, uh, three yep. times to Asia. Because we uh, did at Japan, Yokohama, and, and, and in Beijing. Beijing, and then Busan. And Busan yeah. yeah. So, so three times to Asia, but never to North America. Yeah. Yeah. Nor to Canada. Australia or New Zealand down there. Nope. It's never yeah. been, or to Africa. We have, uh, we have representation uh, everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Craig Mitchell ought to sponsor something, push it to get down there sometime. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> I'd enjoy another safari. Uh, yes. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah please. <laughs> Yes, That'd be great. Gary, have you not ever been to, I'm guessing you've not been to a FISM, have you? I have not. I have not. One of my cruises, however, was supposed, the last cruise that got canceled was ending in Africa. My wife wanted to do a safari, so she was crushed when that got canceled. Mm-hmm. But, uh, maybe maybe some other time. Nothing so, better yeah. than getting up at five o'clock in the morning to see animals that want to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> True. I have a flat tire in the middle of the uh, evening when it's completely pitch dark and you have in, you're in the cheetah territory and they're like, everybody out of the car because we need to change the wheel and we cannot do that. I'm like, okay, no light, just the phones with the flash, oh, looking man. around, hearing strange noises. How fun is that compared to I don't know. To stare at you. <laughs> There was something before we wrap up over here. I don't want to go too much longer, but uh, you had broken your wrists at one time when you were out on a cruise and, uh, and had to kind of take mm. off. Did they help flighted you back out uh, over there? That uh, Yeah. Tim is saying, uh, Fizz in Melbourne. That'd be great. Yes, <laughs> yes please. Push for it. Come on, Tim. <laughs> I'll go for you. I'm there. I'll, I'll come back. Uh, and so uh, have you ever, uh, Sean, had any physical ailments or whether you've gotten sick or had to be taken off a ship or something? Oh yeah. I've, I've had tons of, they never taken off. I've always made it. I've always done the show. I walked off the front edge of a stage once in the rehearsals, the stage had a big apron and then I went for a, something to eat, came back and the lights were all set and I'd had the apron all darkened. And the stage manager thought if the apron's all darkened, they might as well lower it. So they lowered it to like an orchestra pit. And then, of course, I walked out in the dark with a spotlight to go forward and walk Ooh. right on the front edge of the stage and hit the ground hard. Ooh. It's a good eight, ten foot drop. And oh. I immediately screamed, I'm OK, wanting to make sure the audience <laughs> was happy. And then I realized I had a music stand sticking out of my body. I said, no, I'm not. I was oh, wrong. My. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Reminds me once at a TAOM in which uh, Markham, I think we were in Tyler, Texas, and Markham it was the very beginning of the show, and the curtains open, and the spotlight hits him, and he takes one, two, three steps into the orchestra pit, just like that. He's he's down, and everyone thinks it's part of his act. He's kind of was a funny guy, but uh, his wife was sitting next to me, and she knew it wasn't. And she was saying, "Oh my gosh, what? I hope he's okay." You know, and she was standing up, and I thought, "Is this real?" And that was. Uh, uh, so, uh, in fact, C.J. Johnson's talking about the same thing. Yep. Tired, the TOA, there you go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's C.J. We were just talking about that. <laughs> Gary, just a neighbor up the road uh, from you. Uh, but, uh, yep, P.J. was uh, there. That was that was an incredible thing. So you were okay. You had a thing sticking out of you, a microphone sticking out of you. And so they what they do? Just out, they you? stopped the show for five minutes. They wrapped me up. Uh, first aid person, one of the union people came out, wrapped me up, said, you're good to go. I said, yeah, I'm still breathing. I guess I'm good. Audience cheer. Got a leaping ovation at the end of the show because people were like, he did that whole show while bleeding. He's so good. <laughs> the show must go on. <laughs> yeah. Not sure it always has to go on, but it has for some reason. 
for some times it has, which was that uh, last story that I'll tell and we'll kind of wrap up. And that was with Walter Blaney one time telling me where he was getting ready to be introduced and he was standing in the wings and he had his uh, lasso getting ready and his, you know, 10 gallon hat. And they said, uh, please give a big warm welcome for Walter. Blah! And the guy dropped over and the music's going, da, 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 and he comes out and the guy drops and the medics and different people are coming in. He died of a heart attack. Oh, I mean, wow. like right there before he hit the floor. And so the guy, uh, Walter said, well, normally they say the show must go on, but this is a completely unusual, different situation. We're going to close the show before it even begins and intend to this. Thank you guys. Good night. I mean, I mean, how much worse could that get? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, I hate to end that on a bummer, but I want to thank each and every one of you guys. <laughs> None of us much. died. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's right. I'm so glad we've had this chance together to, uh, as Carol Burnett used to say on her show, I'm, <laughs> that we were able to uh, to be here with uh, each other and to enjoy a little bit of time and uh, some uh, refreshments then, regardless of the time of the morning, day or night. Thank you very much <laughs> for joining us as you have, where you have. Next week, we're going to be from different time zones also, because uh, although Rocco and Eric DeCamps are from New York, Rocco is actually in Las Vegas and Tim Ellis, of course, in Australia. So we're going to be having a lot of different time zones. So I'll tell you what, if you guys will just hang on for just a moment uh, and uh, after I end the broadcast so I can just chat with you guys just for a bit more. But I just want to say thanks again. Cheers to each of you guys. So, Cheers. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> And so there we go. That was uh, fun. Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, great. Thank you, uh, CJ. Thank you, uh, Jerry uh, and uh, Mike Miller. Yep. Can't wait to see everybody then again. We're going to be seeing quite a few of each other uh, over the next few weeks coming up with a lot of conventions. Bang, bang, bang. I mean, we're going to be having after uh, Abbott's is going to be the Collectors Expo in Vegas. And then after that, the TAOM in Austin and then the Columbus Magi Fest. And then we're going to be having uh, the MAS. There's going to be the Atlanta Harvest of Magic. There's going to be the uh, Tricks, which is the Tri-C's out in Raleigh, South North Carolina uh, with Scott Robinson. Just a very busy uh, year. I'm not going to all of those, but I'm going to more than half of them. And I'll be reporting those uh, on the podcast. And so I want to remind everybody again to go and check that out. And again, we had this week, I was let go this morning, was the one with Michael Chout, uh, who is the producer of Monday Night Magic. So go and check that one out. Uh, and uh, I, I know you will enjoy that. So Harriet, thank you very much. I will be seeing you probably volunteering at Abbott's for several of the things uh, that will be then next week uh, at the, uh, or in a couple weeks at uh, at Abbott's uh, get together and uh, thank you Tony and uh, uh, thank you Everett uh, Chapman I know you're good buddies with uh, Gary as well so glad uh, you were here joining us uh, here around the virtual bar Clark I'm so glad that you were able to make it and I know you're looking forward to seeing uh, Boris if he can make it to May MAS and also I'm hoping that Maureen Hopman and some other people can come down from Canada for the uh, 4F convention well as I was mentioning at the beginning of this this was something that was going to be the uh, our next but it is our next to the last episode we've got uh one more left to go that's going to be this next week and uh we're going to have something special then next week that uh, you don't want to miss not only just the great guests we're going to be having but some other, something else i prepared especially for next week so this has uh, been, a, again, a wonderful episode with some wonderful friends, which include not just my three guests that I had this evening, but each and every one of you. And I thank you so very much. I consider you uh, all personal, close friends. Thank you for joining me around this virtual bar and kind of keeping us going throughout this last year when we've had to actually be at home and cloistered the way we have. This has been uh, unprecedented, but uh, uh, you've uh, kept our life, I think, our sanity by sanity by being here week after week. So I thank you guys very much. And so uh, until next week, this is Scotty out.